Well, good morning, Hope. It's good to see you this morning. Happy Father's Day for you dads out there. We're glad that you're here, and hopefully you were able to get some of those uh, trivia questions right. And we're just grateful that we can gather together this morning as we come to celebrate and worship the ultimate Father, and that is God. And so this morning, as we sing and as we lift our hearts and our praises to Him, I just encourage you to do so with, with a heart that's unfettered, just as you're running to your Father this morning. Uh, do so with a heart that's open and uh, allow yourself to receive from him this morning through the spirit, the word that's going to be preached in a little bit and the lyrics that we're singing, the scriptures that we're reading uh, and make it a great day today. Would you stand with us and let's read through our opening scripture this morning from second Corinthians chapter one, verse 20, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. What does that mean? It means that all of creation, all of God's promises, all of the law was fulfilled when Christ came to this earth. And so all of God's promises are yes, because they are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And when we say amen, we're actually speaking a Hebrew word, amin, which means let it be so. Let it be. I agree in what has happened. And so as we sing this song, know that we are singing about the promises that God has fulfilled through his son, Jesus Christ, and we agree with what he has done. Let's join our hearts and our voices together this morning.
Father's Day is one of those days that we get to celebrate thinking back on our lives where we've had somebody that was there to pick us up when we fell down, to kiss our boo-boos, to confidently say, it's going to be okay, there are no monsters in your closet or under your bed. And I would venture to say that most of us have had that experience, a father figure in our lives that was able to guide us and lift us up and carry us on. And I know that there are some of us who didn't have that, and maybe it wasn't the most exciting thing growing up. We recognize that. But there's one thing that we all have in common, and that is a father who loves us relentlessly. 
who is always there with open arms, who is always there ready to pick us up when we fall, ready to encourage us when we're scared, ready to give us that boost of confidence that we need to say, you can do this. I have faith and I have trust in you. But of course, we don't do that in our own strength. We do that through the strength of Jesus Christ and the Spirit. We want to teach you a new song this morning called Run to the Father. And I think we can all, in one way or another, relate to this idea. Whether it's as we were a child or now as we've come to know God in our life. Jesus Christ is our Savior. We have a Father that we can run to who will always pick us up. Listen to what the scripture says from Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30. It says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. God is a good God. He's faithful and just in all that he does. He is always there to pick us up. And so as we sing this song this morning, just be reminded that God is a God that you can run to, a Father that never fails. He sees you for who you are. He sees you where you are. He sees you in your current condition. And he has a plan for you. And so as we read, as we sing, just soak in these words, knowing that you can run to him at any time. Oh, my. 
around to you because your arms are open and you say, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. I will teach you and I will comfort you. God, this morning for us, would you do that? Would you allow us to run into your arms this morning? To fall into your grace, to lay our worries and our fears before the throne of an almighty God. To know that you have a plan and you have a purpose for each and every one of us. God, thank you for your love, for, for relentlessly pursuing us. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the ultimate price that he paid so that we can have life, so that we can stand and sing in joy. God, I ask now that you would just prepare our hearts. Let us hear from you today. Guide Josh as he speaks this morning and help us to glorify you with our time, with our energy. Father, with all that you've given us, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. And all God's people say, amen. Thanks. This morning, let me just uh, bring you greetings once more. We're glad you're with us here at Hope Church, either uh, here in the building or online. I'm super glad to have you with us once again this morning. Got just a couple of things that I want to bring you up to speed on. First off, I want to remind you that this coming Saturday morning, the Disaster Relief Team will be hosting their annual pancake and sausage breakfast. Um, if you've been around Hope for long at all, you know that if you do this well, you'll stop eating on Thursday this week so that you can be ready for Saturday morning. Um, it is a free will donation uh, to help benefit their ministry, and uh, we'd encourage you to come on out. You can see the details there on the screen um, or online. Um, it's a great thing, Saturday morning, this Saturday. I um, also want to look a little further into the summer to August the 9th, where we're excited to be featuring our Backyard Bash and Splash. This is sort of our big celebration of coming back together, all together at once. It'll be an outdoor service, uh, weather permitting, out back on the field. You can bring your chairs, lawn chairs, and uh, that way you can kind of space out and stay away from folks as much as you need to. And uh, we're really excited about it. The splash part of this has to do with our baptisms that'll be taking place that day. We're really excited to be doing that again. Um, right when we came to the uh, stay-at-home order, um, we were just about to baptize a bunch of folks. So we're finally going to get them baptized. We'll also be opening that up for others who wish to be baptized, and you'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks. Finally, this morning, I want to bring you up to speed on a little shift that will soon be taking place in our staff team here at Hope Church. We've been privileged to have Ross Kilgore as a member of our team these last nine years and um, he has just contributed so much to the worship ministry and the youth ministry here at Hope. And in the next couple of months, Pastor Ross will be making a bit of a change. He'll still be with us here at Hope Church, just in a little bit of a different capacity. Now, when Ross first started his work with Hope Church, he assumed a role that he knew was going to be pretty challenging. His work with worship ministry and student ministry often placed him in the situation of needing to be in two places at the exact same time. And for the past couple of years, he's been in conversation with the leadership here at Hope Church about the challenge of that situation, as well as the time that both ministries were requiring of him to be away from his family in the evenings. So at their most recent board meeting, the Board of Deacons uh, again considered how Hope might come alongside Ross and help in that situation. After much thought and prayer, the board and Ross came to an agreement for a part-time position for Ross exclusively in worship ministry. So you'll still see him leading our worship services down the hall in the Family Life Center, and you'll still see him helping out with all of the, uh, the all-church worship services. But in addition to his work here at Hope, he'll also be solidifying other employment opportunities here in our community to help fill out the rest of his work world. Now, this obviously leaves us with a gap in our staff team here at Hope, and we'll begin working tomorrow morning, actually, to begin to find a new staff member who will come and join our team here at Hope. That individual will focus most of their energies on meeting the ministry needs of our middle school students. Now, they'll also be caring for a few other things um, under their oversight to help fill out their role and to help them use their gifts best to benefit the corner of the kingdom that we call Hope Missionary Church. We're tremendously excited to be able to help Ross with that. Um, we're excited that he has a burden to be with his family in the evenings, and we're super excited to see whom God might lead to come and join our staff team here at Hope Church. 
We have a great team together, and they work great together. And today we're excited that while Pastor Gary has a Sunday off, um, that we can have someone from our own staff team come and speak with us this morning. And so it's my privilege in just a moment to get to share with you the man, the myth, the legend, Pastor Josh Nash. Good morning, Hope Church. You know, I thought I'd, uh, I'm going to pull an audible here, which is always exciting. I'm sure Chris is excited about that. But I thought, you know, since it's Father's Day, since I saw the, I don't know if you got to see the countdown video we had in here and all the great bad dad jokes on there, but I thought, what better way than to share one more with you? So I hope you're taking notes. So what, what is a, a pirate's favorite letter? R. You think it's R, right? Yeah, pirates love, or they like the letter R, but a pirate's true love is the C. Where is that? I need, a, I need a laugh button up here. What is going on? Well, thank you for being here with us. Uh, you know, at this point, we'll just give a shout out to the folks on the other side, uh, the next two services at the Family Life Center. Thank you for being here with us, and also to everyone up at North Campus. So glad you're able to join us this morning. You know, as I get started off, I, well, actually, before one thing, I don't want to forget this because we have some awesome kids' worship notes that kids can follow along with. And um, one of those in there is what socks Josh is wearing this morning. So I want to make sure, before we go any further, you see that they're pigs. I went all out. This was actually in the men's section, believe it or not. I found it in the men's section. So we had to go special. You know, only the finest for you folks this morning here. Well, I do have a confession to share with all of you. And I, you know, it's something, it's something that, looking back to when I was a kid, that it, oh, it just caused so many sleepless nights. It was something that uh, led to, to so much um, self-doubt and insecurity. And it's, it's really, it's something that few people know about me and my wife didn't even know this past week. And that something was I'm horrible at magic eye pictures. We've got one for you this morning. And I hope, I don't know if it translates, I don't know if you're with me on this, but I cannot ever see what one of those magic eye pictures are. Oh, it's, it has caused years of frustration. It has caused so much heartache for me is, you know, my, in the early 90s, my family started getting these books of magic eye pictures, and my parents would just be ooing and aahing over the pictures they saw. My sister, my friends, my dog would be ooing and aahing over the pictures they saw, and there I was just, well, that's just a, a bunch of nothing. I just couldn't ever, ever see it. no. Or you could say, you know, I thought, maybe I'll see it someday. And I'm like, yeah, right. When pigs fly. I got slightly more jokes, some more laughs on it. I don't know if you could, I don't know if this works here. I'm told it's a shark. So hopefully somehow that comes across that there's some shark in there somewhere. Um, or maybe you're with me and you've never been able to see him. And this is just bringing back all that deep-seated away angst that you've tried to forget about for, for years. Well, today as we, as we get into our scripture, uh, we're, not, we're not talking about an unseen, or our scripture, we're not talking about an unseen picture, but an unseen person. Someone on the fringes. We're not, it's not about a, a fad that, um, that kids left out on, but a woman 
who's on the run. Would you turn with me to Genesis chapter 16? And as you're turning there, I just want to set the scene for you a little bit. We have the main characters here. You have Abram, and Abram was, we know, was called by God back in Genesis 12, called by God, promised to be a, a great nation. But he's been waiting 10, 15 years for that promise, and there's still no kid. He and his wife Sarah, Sarai, aren't getting any younger, and actually she's been barren. She's not been able to have kids this whole time. So they work a plan out. Sarah gives her slave Hagar to Abram as a wife, and they decide they're going to go through human means to fulfill God's promise. And that's not a good plan. Hagar gets pregnant right away. And then all of a sudden, Sarah is jealous. Maybe Hagar was gloating a little bit. And her, this foolproof plan she had has made her out to be a fool. Left her feeling like the fool. And you now if we put ourselves in her shoes, in that culture, a woman, so much of a woman's worth was defined by uh, what, being a mother, being able to have kids, being a good wife, and here she is, not, not able to do that, not able to mother, to be the mother of her husband's kids, but yet this other woman is, and it's a very messy situation, and I, you can see all those, those years of insecurity, those years of questions about her worth are coming right back up to the surface again. Abram doesn't want to get in the middle of any of this. Sarah treats Hagar horribly, and then Hagar runs. And that's where we pick up this story in verse 7 of chapter 16. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where, are you, where have you come from, and where are you going I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery he will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Right off the bat, I mean, we, we see a few things here. Right off the bat, we see a couple of names given in this passage. And the first name in the Hebrew is El Roy, El Roy. And so you are the God who sees me. And there is incredible significance to this name. And, and yeah, it's this unveiling of a little bit of, the, of who God's character is. And that's powerful. But there's something, there's something very unique about this encounter because we have other places in scripture where we see names of God being revealed but what we don't see is someone telling God or speaking to God that name it wasn't God's self-revelation here it was well it was his self-revelation to show himself to Hagar but then Hagar says, you are El Roi, you are, there are all these other gods, but you are the God who sees me. And that is very, very powerful. Because he saw the unseen person. And then we also later get the name Ishmael, the name her son's going to be. God hears is what that means. God hears. And that is, would be such a powerful reminder for her, pointing her back to God's presence when he found her when she was this unseen, unheard person that you know, no matter what life brought her, she can know that God had saw, seen her, that God sees her, that God hears her, that God is, is with her. As we dive in, there's 
And there's three deep truths we can take from this passage. First, when God sees us, or that, that God sees us even when we're unseeable, even when we feel invisible, God sees us. He sees us even when no one else does. And, and this, could, this is something that we can agree on in our heads, and we cannot, and we can believe it's true, but maybe that reality of it doesn't sink deep within our soul. Maybe we, we don't really understand that deep significance of it in our lives. You know, and there's some of us that love to be the center of attention. Some of us love to be in the spotlight, that love to, to make a scene, that love to be loud, and there's others that that they'd rather be out in the limelight, that they'd rather be behind the scenes, that they'd they'd rather blend in. And there's nothing wrong with either of those people. That's just how we're wired. But but how tragic is it? If someone goes through their life, walks through life unnoticed and unloved. I just read an article this week on the website CNET.com talking about the, the COVID shutdown and the loneliness that people have been feeling and, and, and how that loneliness and isolation can actually have real, significant, real physical impacts to us. It can impact our health. It's not just a, it's a, it's a, yes, it impacts our mental state, but it can impact our physical health too. We need community. We need other people. We need to be seen in love, seen in love. That's who we are, and to lack that has negative implications. That lost assurance leads to a heightened awareness and stress, which in turn can lead to lost sleep, increased anxiety, even weight gain. So thinking of that, imagine how Hagar is feeling in this moment where she's gone and she's left everything she's known. She's left the life, any hope of a, the semblance of a life that she had. At least in the last couple of months, this with this isolation, we, we felt alone, but we can feel alone together, and we can know we're all in this together. But she felt completely isolated, completely alone. There was no one looking out for her. And it's into this scene of hopelessness that God enters in, revealing himself to a person who in that culture, well, they, she wouldn't have been seen at all. She, it's not just how she would have been seen. She wouldn't have been seen. She was a nobody. She was a runaway, pregnant, Egyptian slave girl. No social standing in the world she found herself in. No family, no, none of her people present to take her in, to offer her refuge. No real chance for any man to take her as a wife in that culture. Not now with how she is. To put it bluntly, in that world she was used in damaged goods. The epitome of the least of these. And when all looked lost, and it's not a stretch to say that for all extents and purposes, Hagar's life was over. In that moment, God saw the unseen. He saw the unnoticed, the outcast. He, he gave her a promise of a future beyond anything she could fathom. That he was with her and that there was a future for her and there was a future albeit somewhat tumultuous, there was a future for that unborn son of hers too. That God sees her, that God saw her, that God sees the unseen, even the unseeable, is this grand truth about his nature laid bare for us. It's something that connects to our lives, pointing to his relationship with us too. That second truth is that that God seeing us points us to our true worth and identity. Oprah Winfrey, and she was reflecting on the, her many, many years in television, all the interviews she had given, all the people she had talked to. She said, I, I talked to nearly 30,000 people on this show. And all 30,000 had one thing in common. They all wanted validation. I would tell you that every single person you will ever meet shares that common desire. 
And she went on to define validation as a simple act of letting people know, I see you, I hear you, and what you say matters. Wasn't that incredible? I don't, I don't think Oprah, I don't, she doesn't come across as being a biblical scholar by any means, but the truth, she, what she pointed out here points directly to what we see, how God reveals himself to Hagar in Genesis 16, that God sees that God hears. Those two names, El Roi and, El, and Ishmael, pointing to that promise of God. You know, we can respond in very, very unhealthy ways at times seeking after that thing we, we long for most. I've seen people give up everything they've had to be validated, just to be acknowledged, just to be affirmed, to be seen. And how many stories do we know, or maybe we've even lived, where the, of that pursuit of validation that costs countless hours, countless dollars, countless heartaches in our lives, just seeking after that thing. And even us as Christians, even if you're in Christ, we're still not immune from that seeking out of validation too. And we, we can know that's obviously true because we live it, but just because it's obviously true doesn't mean it's any less tragic. In fact, it might even be more so. But God saw Hagar, and he sees you too. And if you've been seen by God, and, and he has claimed you as his own, and guess what, if you're in Christ, well, yeah, he has well, then what other source of validation, what other source of approval or affirmation is there left to seek? And if we're constantly seeking to be affirmed, we become a slave to that pursuit. It becomes the driving force in our lives. But if we really embrace whose we are and who we are in him, then there's freedom found from all that other stuff. You know, at this point, we can start throwing in all the buts in there as we think about this because we know our failings all too well but I can say but what but why do I, I just keep saying this or but I just keep doing that or but I, I know I'm just not good enough but this is the same God the same God who chose childless Abram and Sarah to become a great Nation. This is the same God who called hiding Gideon a mighty warrior, the same God who called Simon, who, if you remember, went on to deny Christ three times. He called him, renamed him Peter, Rock. That same God sees you, that same God hears you, that same God has called you his own, claims you as his. If you are in Christ, you truly are his. You're part of his chosen, set-apart, sent people. In Christ, you are called God's righteousness. And that's just incredible. Let the certainty of your identity in him ring true to the very core of who you are. Because unless it does, well, this next truth becomes downright impossible. This last part, this last truth we find from this passage is that God calls us to see others through his eyes. And, and yeah, it's not explicitly in this passage. It's not stated in there, but we see something very true, something significant of God's nature in this story, in this encounter. He's El Roi, the God who sees me. And if we're living our lives as a yes to Jesus, if we're, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, if we're ambassadors of Christ, then who we are and what we're about should be, we should be about who he is and what he's about. The problem is when we look at seeing others is that far too often we we don't see them for who they actually are. And, and part of that is, yeah, we all try and put our best foot forward. We all try and, and show only the best parts of who we are. We can all have that temptation and that tendency. But we can also, if we, 
if we look through our own eyes are also if because of what we're going through in life that skews the way we see other people too. And if we look through only our eyes and interpret through only our understanding, we're left not with a true picture of what someone is, we're left instead with really a caricature of that person where some features are are exaggerated and brought out to the front and and others are shrunk and maybe even hidden away. And and caricatures can be something that are fun at the mall or fun when you're on vacation or they can be something that your freshman year of college might even get you elected to the student senate because there was a giant one of you at Huntington College. But in life, if all we see are caricatures, and we miss the real person, that's beyond tragic. That's beyond tragic. And the solution isn't just to look harder. It's as we continue to seek after Jesus, as, as we continue to turn to him and learn from him, our sight starts to get clear and clear and clear, and all those exaggerated parts start to come into their proper alignments, and we get a truer and truer picture of who others are, who we are too, but who others are. But we're not called to do that at a distance either, and we don't see God in Genesis 16 looking from afar and seeing Hagar and saying, oh, that's just too bad. I wish someone would do something about that because I can see she's in a horrible situation. Instead, God comes near. He draws near to where she is. He meets her in that hopeless moment, bringing new life, bringing a promise, bringing hope beyond anything she, anything she could imagine. In that same way as we see people There's that call to go near to them too. And that call could be a call across the world as some of our our missionaries here at Hope, some of the ones we've heard of the last month or so have shared about. Could be that call across the world. It could be that call to the least of these in Fort Wayne or the least of these in Bluffton that they would be seen and heard, that that, that they could know that God cherishes and treasures them too. It it could even start with just looking right across the street and seeing that person there with new eyes, seeing them for who God has made them to be and speaking his truth, his love into their lives, whether near or far, you are called by God. You are sent by him to show him to the world as his ambassadors. So I'll leave you with three questions. Three questions to think about. Three questions as we try and let this really sink in. And the first is, is the truth that God sees you deep in your soul? Because we can believe God sees everything, but miss that he sees us. We can know that God loves everyone and miss that he loves us. But is that truth, is that deep in your soul, is that coursing through you, knowing that I am seen and known and loved by God Almighty, and there's nothing left to prove, because I am his, and I can live for him. Second question, how are you seeking out the one who sees you? If you If you want your identity to be grounded in and anchored in the truth of who he has made you to be, well, you got to spend time being with that person who made you, being with the one who has given you that identity. And if you're not spending time with him, you're never going to get to that deep truth of who he's called you to be. It's as simple as that. Just being with, seeking out. God. And if you seek him out, he's not gonna, he doesn't stay far away. He draws near. Know that. Third, are you seeing others through Jesus' eyes? Are you going near to where they are? Are you seeing them with the love of Christ? Are you meeting them with the gospel, the gospel that carries hope 
for everyday life, the gospel that carries hope for right now and the gospel that carries hope for eternity? Are you going and seeing them? Church, we have been, yes, we, we've spent a lot, a lot of time this morning. All of, our, all of our songs were about who we are in Christ, but if we just sit and stay at who we are in Christ and just say, oh, that's nice, I feel better about myself, then we've missed the point of who he's made us to be because he hasn't just made us to be sitting here. He wants you to know who you are in him, but he wants you to know who you are in him to go to show his love, to show others and point them to the truth of who he has made them to be too. So let's go on a mission with the love and hope of Christ, seeing the world through his eyes. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that, that you are the God who sees us that our lives are never hidden from you and there is no need for us to hide. Lord, let us rest in the truth of who we are in you and let it, fill, let it well up in us a passion of who you've made us to be. Lord, I pray that our lives would be looking to you and would be lived as a yes to the one who loves us so deeply. Lord, let us see others. Give us eyes to see them. Give us your eyes to see them. Amen. We're going to close the service uh, with a very old song. It feels very old when we sing it. <laughs> it's called Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. It's not really that old, but it feels old when we sing it. It takes me back to the 90s and all of the songs that we were listening to then, um, which now as I say that, I realize that's not that old. But we're going to sing this song as a prayer. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. And that's our prayer this morning. Because he sees us, we need to be able to open our eyes and see him. So would you stand with us? Let this song be a prayer for you this morning. If you don't know it, let the words pour over you this morning as we sing it. And just let it, let it minister to you this morning. Let it be a prayer, you speaking directly to God this morning. For him to open our eyes, let us see him so that we can do his work and sing it together.
as you go. Go knowing that you are loved and cherished by the God Most High, seen by Him. Go with eyes fixed, focused on Jesus, running the race for Him. Would you go as men and women called by God to take His hope to the world? Go on His truth and go on His peace, church. Amen. Have a great day.